Good morning. My name is David Kenner. I'm an instructor at the Block School uh, at UMKC. Today it's my pleasure to speak with Karen Glickstein about the employment issues involving COVID. Karen received her AB from Smith College, cum laude with high honors in government, and her JD uh, from Northwestern University. She is a principal and the office litigation manager of the Overland Park, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri offices of Jackson Lewis PC. For more than 25 years, she has represented employers in discrimination, harassment, and retaliation litigation, ranging from single plaintiff cases to defensive EEOC class action matters. She also has significant experience defending clients in whistleblowing and restricting covenant matters, as well as advising clients on a wide variety of human resource and employment issues. Her, law, her clients range from small family owned businesses to large publicly traded companies. So, Karen, what is going on to start with with unemployment insurance for employers? Well, David, unemployment has been one of the um, hot topics initially when this whole pandemic issue start, started and people were being laid off or being furloughed. The real question was, can I get unemployment? And the answer was yes. The legislation enacted by Congress provided enhanced benefits to a number um, of individuals who were laid off um, or terminated permanently from their positions because of the pandemic. And that was um, gave employers the ability to make some tough business decisions, knowing that their employees would have some kind of a safety net. The issue now has really been as the economy starts opening up and people are coming back to work and employees are being called back to work. If an employee doesn't want to come back to work or doesn't feel safe coming back to work, but the employer has said, we need you to come back to work. Will that employee still be eligible for unemployment? And what's the answer? Well, the answer, like all good legal answers is it depends. Um, if an employee has a legitimate medical reason, perhaps the employee lives with someone who's immunocompromised and coming into the workplace might make it difficult for that individual um, to go back to their living area. That may be a reason for someone to stay on unemployment. The unemployment laws, as you know, vary from state to state in terms of what the standard is for getting unemployment. But if there's a reason why somebody can't come back, um, then the employer may be best allowing the person to take a little bit more extended of an unemployment. And I think we'll probably talk a little bit later, there could be some disability discrimination issues that would come into that as well. How about workers' compensation insurance? If COVID-19 is acquired while working, does an employee have a right to file a claim under workers' comp? or do the employees have to prove that they got COVID-19 while One of the really unusual things about the workers' compensation um, scheme is that for the most part, an employee doesn't have to prove any negligence on the part of an employer to be eligible for work comp benefits. So it differs from a lot of other, say, tort claims that come up. The issue with COVID is that if somebody trips and falls in the workplace, you can tell that the injury occurred at work. COVID, nobody knows where somebody has been exposed. So that's going to be one of the really key issues. Now, having said that, a number of states have issued variations of executive orders or legislative orders stating that there is some kind of rebuttable presumption that an individual contracted COVID at work. So for example, um, in Missouri, the governor at the beginning of the pandemic directed that an order be issued saying that for first responders, there's at least a rebuttable presumption that the injury arose at work. But that's going to be uh, a key issue that's going to be contested in a number of work comp cases, I imagine. About what uh, disability discrimination issues do employees need to, employers need to be concerned? You alluded to that uh, earlier on this morning. Um, so what, what kind of things do we have to think about there? Well, the ADA hasn't gone away with the advent of COVID and employers are rightfully very focused on issues with the Family First um, Family and Medical Leave Act and some other legislation that Congress enacted um, back in March and April. However, um, if an individual either has, uh, an individual themselves has a medical condition that might prevent them to going back to work, then an employer still needs to be able um, and willing and actually engage in an interactive process. So for example, if you have an employee who is asthmatic or has a history of asthma, 
and going into the workplace might be problematic for that individual, even with precautions like masks, because their susceptibility to COVID maybe is greater, then an employer is going to need to work through that same interactive process that we tell employers all the time with any kind of medical condition that constitutes a disability needs to be considered. And so employers are going to need to be incredibly vigilant as employees come back to work, making sure that they continue to accommodate any kind of medical condition that an employee has, if that medical condition can in fact be reasonably accommodated. What about confidentiality of an employee's medical condition? In, in other words, if somebody tests positive for COVID-19, you send them home, can you tell the other employees uh, you may have been exposed? Um, the answer to that is absolutely. And in fact, I think employers have a duty to let people know, not only co-employees, but the local health departments in order to make sure that appropriate contact tracing can be performed. Now, that doesn't mean you give the full identity of an employee, but you certainly would want to allow employees to know that there has been a possible exposure and notify employees. It may be depending on the size of your workplace that different people um, had more of an exposure than other individuals. So you want to be able to parse that out um, in the messaging that you do, but you do want to make sure that people know, and then that appropriate precautions are taken if there was a possible exposure, including perhaps a shutdown, deep clean, um, using EPA regulated or recommended chemicals to make sure that the workplace is safe to return to. Well, in connection with reporting an employee's medical condition, are there HIPAA rules that may restrict that or are there exemptions from that uh, for reporting on an employee's medical condition? If uh, There are exemptions in terms of letting um, proper health officials know that an individual has been, um, that people have been exposed and that there's been an exposure. So notifying the health department is very important so that that contact tracing can occur. All right, let's switch gears now. About what other discrimination issues do employers need to be concerned? For example, if African-Americans are more likely to be negatively impacted by COVID-19, does this impose any special non-discrimination requirements in terms of, say, a disparate impact of a requirement to continue working as an essential employee? You know, a lot of the studies that, at least the ones I've seen that have come out on that disparate impact do deal with um, racial issues um, in terms of where the numbers have been. And a lot of that is, I think, due to communities that perhaps have, in some instances, less access to healthcare uh, or to testing. It's certainly been an issue here in Kansas City um, that we've all read about in the paper. And having said that, an employer's duties are no different than they were before. So in the workplace, the duty on the employer is gonna to be to make sure that you continue to treat everybody the same and that there is no disparate impact in terms of how individuals are treated with regard to things like furloughs or partial layoffs or terminations. Uh, and that the employer continues to be aware that uh, when making those decisions of what the census of an organization looks like and making sure that no one group um, in any protected category, whether it's race or age or religion or national origin, that everybody is being affected equally. What are, what are the requirements for paid medical leave, including FMLA, that are impacted by COVID-19? Well, the traditional FMLA, as you know, doesn't allow for paid leave. And that, so that's a little bit of a separate issue. But the Families First Corona Relief Act that was enacted by Congress at the beginning of the pandemic does provide for a short period of paid leave in certain circumstances. Those circumstances include individuals caring, for example, for uh, a child who is no longer able to attend school or a summer camp. And so employers are gonna continue to get those kinds of requests now that school is ending and so many camps or childcare situations have been um, canceled because of social distancing issues. And employers are gonna to need to make sure that they're paying, giving that kind of paid leave to individuals who have to care for children. Now that said, uh, it's when people are working remotely from home, which is encouraged by most employers if the ability to work remotely is there, employers can start getting into some real issues with how much leave and the leave can be, it doesn't have to be a day at a time, just like 
regular FMLA leave uh, may be on an hour by hour basis. So if you have a two parent family where both individuals are able to work from home and are working from home, you may have one parent using three hours of leave in the morning while the other parent cares for the child and then swapping in the afternoon. And record keeping is gonna be very important, keeping in contact with those employees so that you can, as an employer, make sure that the proper amount of leave is being given to individuals. It's a little bit more difficult to track right now when so few people are actually in the office. What about the issues, leaving aside when somebody is staying at home to care for children or uh, a, a parent, for, uh, uh, what about uh, just if you're sent home to quarantine? If you're sent home to quarantine and the, you're sent home because you have either tested positive or w awaiting the results of a positive test or have symptoms, then there is there are provisions within that leave act for paid leave, again, up to that same 12 week period all combined. What about the non-COVID FMLA issues like pay decreases or bonus issues? Well, so, with those, an employer still needs to be cognizant of the regular discrimination laws in terms of making sure that you're looking at all populations the same. I think that um, there's probably very few places doing pay increases unless it's kind of extra pay right now because somebody is in a first responder type role or an essential function type role. But if employers are making any kind of job related decision, they need to be aware of the full broad spectrum of employment laws that are out there because those all still do apply. What about OSHA issues that are in, impacted by COVID-19 dangers for employees? Well, OSHA, as you know, is the federal organization that maintains and regulates the safety of the workplace. And so OSHA has been giving frequent guidances to employers in terms of safe workplaces. And those guidances, quite frankly, have been changing routinely is more and more is understood about the virus and the risk of spread of the virus and what kind of types of atmospheres. Just um, about a week or so ago, OSHA issued a new directive before OSHA was saying that nobody needed to report COVID exposures. OSHA just amended that guidance. I wanna say the end of April, beginning of May, but I may not be totally recalling correctly on those dates to say that if an employer is already required to keep accident information, then that employer does need to track COVID exposures. So that's kind of one side of the OSHA equation. Another important issue with OSHA is just making sure for all employers that they're providing a safe workplace. And a safe workplace may mean, you know, personal protective equipment if people are starting to have employees back in the workplace now. Does that workplace have masks available? Is there sanitizer available? What kind of cleaning regimen is going on? Can people safely socially distance? Are, I know a lot of my clients have been talking about things that you know, are little things, but really necessary to returning people to the workplace. So if you have a conference room that has 12 chairs in it normally, making sure there's only five or six chairs to ensure that people, if they're in that conference room, socially distance, limiting visitors to certain kinds um, of workplaces. So in the retail environment, we're already seeing some of that as the economy has started to open. And it, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, there are limits on occupancy rates. So all of those kinds of issues um, fall under the safe workplace broad umbrella of OSHA. How about ERISA, ERISA issues that arise under COVID-19? So I am not an ERISA lawyer um, and fortunately have others within my firm who I rely on for technical ERISA issues. But from a 30,000 foot view, um, the kinds of ERISA issues that are there are things like maintaining um, health and medical plans. And there have been a couple of uh, developments on that front with regard to extending coverage and notifications and COBRA issues. If somebody, for example, um, is no longer working because they've been furloughed, a number of employers have been able to work with their benefits providers in what would normally be an ERISA qualifying event. In other words, requiring an employer to let an employee know that the employer portion of the health plan no longer applies to the individual because he or she isn't working the defined number of hours some providers have been working with employers 
to allow the employer to pay those benefits um, with the expectation that when the individual is returned to work, they can be paid in return. In other words, nobody's canceling benefits, which is a huge benefit, if you will, to individuals who are furloughed from work and we're potentially looking at not only no paycheck, but no employee benefits. Let's switch gears again. I assume there are a number of uh, tricks and things that employers have to be very careful about in connection with wage and hour and fair labor standards uh, issues that are impacted by COVID-19, uh, in particular record keeping that would be required for remote work and state laws on reduced wages. There are. So um, different states with regard to the latter point you mentioned in state wages, if an employer is, um, for example, doing across the board pay cuts, the employer needs to make sure that proper notice is given of those pay cuts, um, depending on what jurisdiction the individual, the company has employees in. And that can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So large companies with employees across the country may not be able to implement a across the board pay cut at the same time in each jurisdiction. In some jurisdictions, there's very specific paperwork that needs to be filled out um, and notifications given to employees in writing. Um, New York is one of those examples where there are very specific rules. Um, with regard to wage and hour issues, that's an area that again, employers definitely need to be alert on. Anytime you have remote employees who are hourly employees, non-exempt employees, an employer needs to make sure that any time spent away from the office is reported as time worked. And an employer is going to want to frequently remind non-exempt employees who are working remotely that any time spent working needs to be reported. And by the same token, just like we do in a non-COVID world, if an individual has the need to work overtime and the employer's policies, as many employers' policies do, require approval for overtime work, then the employer should be reminding employees to get that approval before the overtime is worked. Are there any special issues for unionized workers covered by the National Labor Relations Act? Well, for unionized workers, and again, traditional labor law is a um, whole beast unto itself, but most of the union issues are going to be governed by the collective bargaining agreement and employers are going to need to follow whatever procedures are set out in that CBA. If, however, the collective bargaining agreement doesn't provide for whatever the issue is that's being grieved, then the employer and the union are going to need to get together somehow and hammer out whatever the agreement is and work through that traditional process of negotiating to make sure that the issue is taken care of. Switching gears again, how about EEOC guidelines on returning to work following the government ordered shutdowns? What kind of guidelines do we have on this? And again, the EEOC has been one of those agencies that's been very active in issuing guidelines and then reissuing guidelines as situations change. I think the biggest, one of the biggest at least areas coming out of the EEOC relates at least indirectly to those disability discrimination issues we were talking about. And in general, as an employment lawyer, we always counsel our clients, don't ask about health information. You, know, you can only get that kind of information in very specific situations. Yet the EEOC, which had a pandemic guidance even before coronavirus, is a result of um, SARS or H1N1 a while ago, uh, updated that guidance now and has said it is okay for employers to take the temperature of employees before they come into the workplace. Um, it is okay to ask questions about, have you had a fever? Do you have certain symptoms before allowing employees into the workplace? And that really goes to further what we talked about before about the duty to provide a safe workplace. And so if an employer asks those kinds of questions, uh, that should not, at least in and of itself, um, be a reason for someone to, um, try, an employee to try and prevail on some kind of disability claim. Well, continuing in that vein, what can an employer do if someone says they don't feel comfortable returning to work or don't feel safe? Uh, can an employer require employees to have temperatures taken before entering the workplace to uh, wear masks or other PPE uh, when they return to work? 
So employers can definitely require temperature taking and can definitely require that individuals wear masks in the workplace. The only exception to the mask wearing issue would be if somebody has a medical condition that doesn't allow them to wear a mask. Uh, again, perhaps an asthmatic employee that would affect breathing, or if there is a legitimate religious-based reason for not wearing a mask, then that would need to be considered by the employee um, as well. But if, uh, can, it, can an employer terminate an employee if the employee says, you know, I just don't feel comfortable coming back to work right now? So I'm glad you asked the follow-up question because the answer to that is it's going to depend a little bit on the circumstance and what is the reason the person doesn't feel comfortable coming back to work. If it's just, I don't want to wear a mask and nothing more, then yes, termination would certainly be an option. If, however, the employee, um, let's say, has a mental health condition or an anxiety issue that either was diagnosed before or was diagnosed as a result of COVID, then the employer is going to need to get go back to that toolkit of those pre-COVID employment discrimination laws and think about things like, is this a mental health condition that could rise to the level of a disability? Or is this um, a medical condition that would give rise to a potential FMLA leave? And should I, as an employer, be sending out FMLA paperwork? And even though the individual might not um, qualify for paid leave under the Family First um, Coronavirus Act medical leave, they still may qualify for unpaid leave under the FMLA. What can employees insist an employer has, such as masks and temperature taking for employees and customers, or other PPE for employees? So, In, in other words, can the employee require, require the employer to have this stuff? I think the employee certainly has the right to a safe workplace. And what that safe workplace looks like is going to differ from workplace to workplace to workplace, depending on what's happening in the workplace. So in a traditional office environment, I think employers are going to need to make available if they're having people and requiring people to come back to work, to have sanitizer, to have masks, um, to post signs requiring social distancing, those kinds of things. If an employee is in working in a healthcare field, the rules there are a little different. Um, and the even within the legislation um, that provided for the paid leave, there were exemptions there for healthcare workers or other essential workers because those individuals are needed on the front line. So workplace to workplace, um, employees certainly have the right to a safe workplace and the specifics of that are really gonna depend on the position the employee holds. And I think that's one of the reasons quite honestly that so many employers, if they have the ability to allow employees to work from home or work remotely, are suggesting that employees continue to do that if they want, rather than bringing back employees to the workplace. I've heard of a number, again, in the office kind of setting of slowly bringing employees back and more of a ramp up kind of thing to see how things transition and how work goes. In a retail situation, where there are occupancy requirements, an employer probably isn't going to need quite as many employees to come back to work right away. Continuing on with the retail scenario, can an employee uh, insist that, that its employer require customers to wear masks? To wear masks, and we've seen that a lot. The best example um, that comes up that's gotten a lot of press is Costco. Um, which I believe has said across the country, you cannot come in unless you have a mask. And that's a decision that a retailer can make. Are there other best practices that employers should consider as offices reopen in connection with all of this? You know, I think one of the best practices is keeping abreast of what the regulations and rules are in your particular jurisdiction. Here in the Kansas City area, that can be a real challenge because we have two states, multiple counties, cities within the counties, and seemingly inconsistent regulations about who can do what when. Yet employers are going to need to keep up on that to make sure that they're file following the guidelines of whatever relevant jurisdiction is there, making sure that personal protective equipment is available depending on what that looks like in your particular industry. Um, 
or business. So those are some of you know the real obvious things. Other areas are really working with your human resources staff to make sure that people are tracking what needs to be done. So assigning somebody to be the point of contact if you have employees who um, maybe end up going out on a leave or an exposure, having plans in place on how you're going to deal with the possible exposure before rather than after. Those are all the kind of proactive measures and the just be ready measures that are really important that in all of the um, rush to get people out of the workplace back in late March and early April um, and now coming back, um, people were focused on things like unemployment, furloughs, you know, those kinds of issues and didn't really have the time to take close looks at, well, what do we do if this happens or that happens? And being prepared for those kinds of situations is going to be critical as we start to reopen. What are some potential liability uh, issues that employers need to worry about as the economy opens back up and people return to work? What kind of lawsuits have you seen filed uh, with regard, for example, to employee concerns over COVID? So a couple of different areas have shown up in the initial case law, the, the initial lawsuits that have been filed. One is unlike traditional discrimination claims, the um, sick leave provisions um, and other paid provisions of the um, family and medical leave don't require any administrative exhaustion. So we've already seen lawsuits filed where individuals have been denied the right to take paid leave under that legislation that was enacted in March. So that's one area and making sure that employers are compliant and understand that those rules still exist and haven't gone away. Uh, another area where a number of lawsuits have been filed uh, is the whistleblowing arena. We've seen a number of those kinds of lawsuits um, for a host of different you know, reasons that individuals who perceive rightly or wrongly that the workplace is not taking appropriate safety precautions and a complaint has been made and then there's been some kind of adverse action taken. Those kinds of whistleblower cases are something that need to be taken seriously. And again, that goes to the planning of what is your policy? Hopefully the employer has a policy in place anyway about reporting any kind of concerns. What is that policy? Who's gonna react if a report is made? How is that report gonna be investigated? And making sure that you know, any kind of employment related decision, whether it's, you know, a discharge or furlough or demotion is not um, caused by the report of the potential whistleblowing activity. How about uh, immigration? Um, I assume that because of our uh, border closures, it's had some impact on employers that rely on uh, non-U.S. citizens. Uh, what, what are you seeing in that regard? So again, immigration is a really specific issue with all kinds of rules and regulations that I don't practice in on a day-to-day -day basis. But I did check in with a couple of my colleagues who are immigration lawyers. And the most important advice, advice at the general level is if you have employees working with you who are on visas, <clears throat> excuse me, or employees contacting you, is to check with somebody who really understands the rules of whatever particular visa the individual is here on. That said, if an employer um, lays off a worker who's here on a visa, for example, and that employer is not working, that employee status may be affected by the mere fact that they're no longer working. So that can be a real issue and a real concern for individuals who are working subject to a visa. So that's one area. And then another area in general is getting individuals in if there are um, needs that are industry-based for particular kinds of visas and employees employers not being able to fill those roles. So um, immigration issues, very specific, you know, hundreds of different kinds of visas out there and each one's gonna have its own issues. But if you are laying off or furloughing, especially individuals who are here on a visa, you do need to work with that employee and your immigration lawyer. What's the impact of COVID-19 on the WARN Act requirements? So back when um, employers, again, late March, early April timeframe, were starting to furlough or lay off people. There was a lot of discussion in many places about, do I need to issue a WARN Act notice? And WARN Act, for those people who don't know, is a federal law that in certain situations for certain size employees requires advance notice before a mass layoff or um, plant closing. And plant is used in the broadest sense. It can be a business as well. 
the WARN Act procedures apply in general if there's going to be a sustained closing of up to six months. Uh, if an employer, so we saw kind of two things happening. Some employers were going ahead if they had the ability to do so and issuing those WARN Act notices. Um, and part of the WARN Act also requires a business to notify the state in advance so the state can make arrangements. Um, and so that individuals get the notice so that they can start looking for other jobs. The WARN Act really was not designed for the kind of situation we have here in the midst of a pandemic, pandemic where there was not gonna be any adverse effect to the business um, by shutting down and employer, employees for the most part weren't gonna be able to start looking for another job due to the nature of why people were being laid off. So several employers did go ahead and issue more note at warn notices to employees and file with the state. Others um, very realistically believing that this is something that was going to be a temporary furlough um, and something that was not going to last for more than two or three months went ahead and did those furloughs without issuing WARN Act notices. But those employers need to be very careful right now if it looks like they're not bringing back their workforce to make sure that appropriate notices do get filed so that they comply with the terms of the act. I guess then just to kind of conclude, I'm gonna throw you a more open-ended question. What else should employers know as the economy starts opening up and people are returning to work? So I think, you know, each day is a new day and it sounds almost cliche-ish now. Most of us are probably um, tired of hearing about the new normal, which to me really is more the new abnormal. So employers are going to need to react um, and be um, very flexible in how they react to what happens is the economy opens up, uh, you know, slowly um, and hopefully easily. But if there is a second wave, as some people predict there will be, going back to where we were before and knowing how to handle those kinds of situations, I think employers are going to have to um, deal with issues as testing becomes more available. Of you know, are am I in an industry where I you know need to do testing? I think just totally out there on the horizon if antibody testing becomes something that is consistently reliable is that something employers are going to want to consider there are so many questions and unfortunately so few answers so just taking being aware of what's going on in your community in the communities where you happen to have locations or employees and being able to react on a number of different fronts to what might happen in other words stay tuned Yes. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate your taking the time with us today. Uh, your insights, I think, will be very, very helpful to people. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure getting to see you, at least remotely. <laughs> Likewise. And that's a wrap.